Turn your Bibles, church. Go into Exodus chapter 23. That's where we're going to be tonight. We're going to actually cover all 20 or 33, whoa, 33 verses of Exodus chapter 23 here tonight. Now, in chapter 23, much like we're in 20 and 20 or 21 and 22, God continues to give these laws out to uh, his people in Israel in the wilderness there through Moses, through these judges. And he continues these laws, these judgments, right, as he put it. I want to say the do's and don'ts, right? Just right off the bat. These are the do's and don'ts for my children of Israel out there, right? And the judgments that will come because of the do's or don'ts, amen? Basically, they're the laws of the land, and they're to live by these laws. Every man, every woman, every child, every master, every slave, each and every one of them will live to these laws. And all will be equal under two. There's no partiality in these laws. See, God established this, that they would know what is right and what is wrong. Pretty much that's it. The do's and don'ts, right? What is just and what is unjust? Those do's and don'ts. And he just made it very clear here. You know, why did he do this? Think about that. Why did God do this way back then with Israel? Why did he put these judgments? Why did he give them all these, these do's and don'ts? And how to take care of these disagreements and all that kind of stuff? Why? He wanted to set his people apart. You understand? God's people, the Jewish people, he wanted to set them apart and make them different than the world because the rest of the world wasn't this way. He wanted to give them these laws, these judgments, that they would live justly, you see, to set them apart. God wanted Israel to be a beacon in the world, a light into the world. What did Jesus tell us? Be set apart, right? Be holy. What does he say? Be the light of the world. Same thing. God wanted that from Israel, to be that beacon of the world, uh, the, his people would be just and holy. Holy actually means to be set apart and be set apart for him. And so that's why he gave him this. He gave him just and, and right laws, basically, in these judgments that they are going to live by. It would be good for Israel and it would be good for the nation that was going to be too, right? I mean, there are a lot of people right now, but they're actually going to become a nation, the nation of Israel. He gave them these just and right laws. You know, many of our civil laws today that exist today are laws of this uh, that came, right, from the Word of God. Do you understand that? Came from God's Word. These laws that are between the rights and wrongs, the do's and the don'ts, right? The laws that we even live by. I mean, you think about it. Did, did our nation at its founding, did our forefathers, did they create these laws? Did they originate them? No, they didn't. They come from the Bible. They were passed down, right? They read the Word of God. And we'll see some of those things. Obviously, we have to apply it into today versus back then. But I've been doing that. We've been applying those things today compared to back then. These civil laws originated with God. And the many that we see today, the do's and the don'ts, you know, and that it was passed down, the laws that were passed down through the Word of God, through the Bible. You know, you think about why has so many societies, especially, I'm going to speak about America, all right? This is the land we live in. This is the land that God gave to this people, right? We have, well, we kind of have borders. But anyway, we got borders, just like Israel we have borders. Uh, we've been given this land to possess this land, just like Israel been given that land to possess that land. But why have the, uh, say, these societies adopted it? Because they're good, they're right, they're true, and they're pure, right? That's why. Because they are proper laws. They're just. The do's and the don'ts gives justice to all, you see. All. Justice to all. There again, in our Pledge of Allegiance, right? And justice for all. It just made sense, and that's why our forefathers adopted that. Now, the second part of chapter 23, the first part, he's going to give some laws out. The second part of chapter 23, he's going to give some special ordinances or also these judgments, these laws of Israel and these laws towards him, towards God for their time. Some of this is for their time, okay? But we'll see there again how it applies to our time still today, right? But it's for their time. 
These laws that he's going to give them, it's going to test their obedience towards him, the people of Israel, this nation that is forming. It's going to test their obedience. It's going to test their faith. It's going to test their trust in him. These laws he's going to give them, how, what they should do for worship, how they are to worship, laws about sacrifice and what the sacrifices are going to be, laws about giving, what they're going to give, justice towards God, right? It's the same thing. The do's and don'ts of justice toward God. See, these laws, he gives man. He's, he gives these laws to man that man would give man, right, his due, right? He, man would be just before man. And at the same time, he gives these other laws or judgments where God would get his due, his worship. Jesus made that very clear. You remember the story? It's in Mark 12, 17. It will be a scripture on the screen. But the Pharisees were testing Jesus, and they're saying, hey, hey, should we be paying taxes? Should we be paying taxes? Well, what did he say there? Jesus says, hey, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Render to God what he is due, and render to man what he is due. Amen? We pay our taxes. Why? Render to man what man, God, governments do, and render to God what God is due. And so this is right and just, and, and that's how God divides this up, right? There's those things that are between man to man, but there's also those things between man and God. Those do's and don'ts towards man are going to be important. They're going to be very important for the civil justice and the peace in the land of Israel as Israel begins to, build, to become a nation. 40 years in the wilderness, by the way. Even those 40 years out there. It's going to be very important for them to have those do's and don'ts between the men, between men themselves, right? But then also these do's and don'ts between God are going to be very important too. What will they bring? They'll bring blessings upon that nation. They'll bring protection upon that land. They'll bring blessings. They'll bring protection. You know, we say God bless America, right? Well, God wants our worship to go to him. And really, today, we should be saying, America, bless God, because we've lost a lot of that within our nation. Anyway, let's uh, pray, and we're going to get into tonight's message. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Lord, as we study here tonight, Lord, uh, show us those things that are for us, for our land, and, and for us, God, individually. Teach us through your word, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message tonight is Do's and Don'ts, right? The do's and the don'ts. I want to tell you something, okay? In the Old Testament, under the, under the laws, the Jews under the laws, it was much of that do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts. As Christians, as Christians saved by the blood of Christ, it becomes wills and won'ts, you see, not the do's and don'ts. It becomes the wills and won'ts. I will not do this. I won't do this. I will worship my Jesus because of that saving blood. Those do's and don'ts had to be because they had to do this, right? Which they could never do it right, and they never were atoned for their sins. Anyway, we have Jesus. So the do's and don'ts turn into the wills and won'ts as a Christian. In chapter 23 now, let's begin in verse 1. He says, you shall not circulate a false report, right? You shall not lie, basically. You shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked uh, to be an unrighteous witness, a liar. And don't put your hand with the wicked. And continue on here, he says. You shall not follow it. Uh, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Don't go with the mob. Nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. Literally pervert. Make justice a perversion, right? He says, you shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. i break this down a little bit, these first three verses there. See, this is a law of having really respect for for the law, too. A law to respect the law. And he says, no, you do not go out there. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you uh, testify in a dispute. You shall not follow those. You shall not go out and be a part of the mob, right? 
the part of the riot, the part of the crowd. You know, in, uh, there in the beginning, it says, you shall not circulate a false report. Well, remember I told you there was the Ten Commandments we've seen in chapter 20, and then these are, kinda, these are also kind of the finer details of the Ten Commandments. It says, you shall not, you shall not uh, uh, circulate a false report um, a be, or be an unrighteous witness. Well, what is that one? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That's the finer details he's getting into on that there. In verse 1, and there again, it says, you shall not... You shall not circulate a false report and do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. You shall not follow a crowd and do evil. You shall not be a part of this mob and lie and lie because of a pressure of a mob and going with the crowd, unrighteously following a riotous bunch. Boy, did we see a bunch of that. Did we see a bunch of that a couple years ago and it's still taking place today. Through Black Lives Matter, through Antifa, large mobs defying the law, having no law, lawless, or they were lawless, they had no law, burning places, burning places down, looting. It's still going on today, guys. You see, this is, he says, no, this mob mentality, all of this, you are not to be a part of that. You know, that was, what did they claim it as? What did they claim it as? Well, it's interesting because they claim it as social justice, right? That's how Antifa and BLM and these, these mobs claimed it. They claimed it as social justice. Is it? Of course not. Of course not. What is it? It's criminal behavior. And God's speaking right to that, criminal behavior. When you become a mob, it's criminal behavior. Amen? Perversion of justice. He says, do not pervert justice that way. You can't call that social justice. That's a perversion of justice. Justice that's per per perverted by evil, evil, evil men. Amen. And I guess you could put evil women too. In verse 2, he says there, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil. If you're following the crowd, you're doing it to do evil, right? Or sh uh, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert this justice. That's a clear do not do this, right? <laughs> when we talk about the do's and don'ts, this is a very clear do not. A clear this is evil in God's eyes. It is evil, he says. And it's clear it's an injustice. You know, turn your Bibles. If you got your Bible in your hand there, turn it to Matthew chapter 25. We all there? I'm sorry. I just turned back a little bit here. Um, we see there where they were seeking false witnesses, right? We're going to see in Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 59, we're going to see where, where uh, Jesus was before the Sanhedrin court. He'd been arrested before he goes to Pontius Pilate. And we're going to see how, how he, uh, they sought and found these false witnesses. When you seek out a false witness, a liar, you can find him. It says there in verse, two, uh, um, I mean, verse uh, 59, as we read down, now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimonies. They sought. They literally went out there and sought for it. Can we find some liars? Right? They sought some false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, there was a whole bunch of them that came forward anyway, but they still found nothing. False witnesses came forward, they found none. But the last two false witnesses came forward, oh, they found two more. We got two more false witnesses. And he said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silence, right? Why would you try to answer a false witness, right? 
Why would you try to respond to a liar? Many times we've got to take that in. Why respond to a liar? He said, but these... Uh, uh, but Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under the oath by the living God. Oh, man, he's putting him on an oath by himself, right? I, get, I'll, I swear by myself, Jesus is the living God. Tell us, you are, the, are you the Christ, or the Son of God? Now, Jesus, he's going to answer that one. He said to him, it is as you had said. Nevertheless, I say to you, uh, hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of these witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think, he asked him. And they answered and said, he is deserving of death, right? They literally sought false witnesses. And they, they, they actually found some false witnesses out there, right? They found liars and they found a mob. There was a whole bunch of false witnesses. Like I say, today, guys, it's not hard to find false witnesses. It's not hard to find those mobs. It's really not. And that's why God told them, hey, you can't have this part of your land, right? Right? Those liars uh, calling it justice. We see it all the time. They're getting caught all the time. Isn't that the great thing? The great thing is in the end, liars get caught. And if nothing else, there will be the judgment by God to those false witnesses. In verse 3 there, he says, You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. Isn't that interesting? Don't show partiality to a poor man. Showing partiality. You don't show it to a poor man. You don't show it to a rich man. He says you just don't show it at all. All will be equal in the law. The word of God says that God is not partial to anybody. Shows no partiality. Right? Yeah, You're no better than me. I'm no better than you. We're all on the same level. I can say today, this showing partiality between the poor and the rich, right? Well, that's been shattered. What does the rich do? They buy the partiality in the courtroom, right? They buy those. It's been shattered actually on both sides. It depends on which mob you're with, with this partiality you'll receive. The rich buy the way, and the poor plead social justice. Actually, what they plead, social equity, they call it. They change that name. They've changed it into social equity, and this is what they plead. And so the same things take place today. In verse 4, he says, If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall... Now this enemy, he says your enemies. This isn't like an Amalekite or one of these guys, a, a, a mortal enemy. This is somebody that you don't like and they don't like you, right? So he says, if you meet your enemy out there ox or his donkey going astray, and you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you, the one who hates you, dislikes you, you know, hates you maybe, you see that donkey, the one who hates you, lying under its burden, and you would uh, refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it now. And he says, you shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. Keep yourself far from a false matter, do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not uh, justify the wicked, and you shall take no bribe, for a, uh, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. And he also says, and you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, he tells him, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So all these laws here, as we see from verse Four through nine. What is, what is God saying? He's, he's promoting kindness, guys. Do you understand? He's promoting kindness out there. Having a right conduct, a righteous conduct before your neighbor, and, and he's promoting this kindness. In verse four, he says, if you, if you meet your enemy's ox, this guy you don't like, or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. Kindness, right? He's implying, you know, this law towards Israel. 
you know, in the command just to do good to your enemy, right? He said, do good. Be kind unto your enemy. Sounds familiar, don't it? What did Jesus tell us? Well, Jesus took it to a whole new bar, actually. In Luke 6, 35, Jesus says, but love your enemies. Actually love your enemies and then do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he is kind. He says to the unthankful and the evil. Jesus took it to a whole new bar, and God's saying, hey, you be kind to that one, right? Get their donkey back to them. Whatever it is, get their donkey back. Help that donkey on its way. He says, if you see a donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, right, and you would refrain from helping it, you should surely help him with it. Guys, donkey, man, get it back to him. Help him donkey on his way. You know, take your enemy, what you might call your enemy, maybe somebody you don't like, all right? Help them pull their pickup truck out of the ditch. That's what he's saying right there. We don't have donkeys, right? So you, you're going along, and there's a guy you don't like, and he's he buried in that ditch over there. You're going to drive around and by? Let me tell you what. Pull that enemy out of the ditch and then see what happens. Things can change, right? When you help that one. It's a little laws towards kindness. In verse 7 there, he says, you keep yourself far from a false matter. Keep yourself from lies, right? Do not kill the innocent and the righteous. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Keep away from lies. Don't take part in lies. I got to say, don't take part in gossip because many times that's lies. Just stop it where it's at, guys. Stop it where it's at. And don't take part. Don't pass on a lie. Just keep away from it. Comes up to you and says, move the other direction, right? You, you really don't need to take it in. Now, in verse 8, it's interesting, because he says there, God tells him, and he says, you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds his discerning. He doesn't say you should pay no bribe, right? He says, Yo, you're not to take a bribe. Well, why would he just say you're not to take a bribe? Because if there was nobody to take the bribe, it wouldn't do any good to be have the payer of the bribe, you understand? What is the more guilty part? To take that bribe. To take a bribe. <coughs> Excuse me, be paid for lies, right? Be paid for lies, literally money. Pervert the truth, be a false witness for money to get paid. Mm. There again, how much of the, we see that in our world today with the elite literally paying bribes to people. They're getting caught all the time, by the way. Thank God they're getting caught. Lies bought to pervert justice. Well, we need these laws today, right? These laws were part of our land, church. You understand? They're part of America. They're just being perverted by these ones. In verse 9 now, it says, Also, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, he says, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Yeah, they were strangers for 360 years in Egypt. This law of kindness again. Laws of kindness towards strangers when you meet. You know, last time I spoke about the fact that when somebody new comes in, first time they walk through the door, you should make your way there. If you don't know their face and don't know their name, you need to go see them. You need to be kind to them, right? If you don't know their name, go that direction. Guess what? You once were a stranger too when you walked through those doors. You were. I was strange. I remember the first time I walked into uh, Calvary Chapel in Prescott. And, uh, man, I was nervous. I was nervous. I'm walking into the church. And all these Christians are going to judge me. And man, they just loved me. They just brought me in and loved me. And, and, and I was a strange, I was a strange stranger, I'm telling you. I was a strange stranger, and they just brought me in. So there it is, this kindness. This kindness here, and kindness really is anyway, kindness is an act of a heart. Do you understand? 
It's not about a mind. It's not about thinking it out. It literally is of your heart. You know, I got to tell you, and uh, people have said it to me before, I am drawn, and maybe that's why you're here tonight, I am drawn toward the unusual, the different, right? Those ones who other people go, well, they're kind of different, you know? I'm drawn towards those. I don't know why. I just find them very, very fascinating many times. And they're strangers, too. If they're a stranger, that's an act of the heart. You're acting with God within you. You understand? That's the Holy Spirit within you. And you're going, wow, you're acting like Jesus would act. Jesus would go right up to a stranger and say, hey, hey, dude, how you doing? Humble and kind, you know? Let Jesus be seen through our actions. This really is when he tells them, hey, you guys, this entire nation was a stranger before too, so you be kind to those strangers. Now we're going to get into the do's and don'ts with God. These laws, that if, if they keep these laws, these do's, right, if they do these things, their nation will be blessed. And uh, if they honor God in these things, their nation will be blessed, and Israel will become a great nation, you see. In, chapter, in verse 10 now, six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. For six years you're going to plant your different sections of land and then gather in your produce. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow. I mean, don't plant it, right? That the poor of your people may eat. And what, they, uh, and what they leave, then the beasts of the field may eat it. You know, the deer and the elk, I guess, or whatever is out there. In like manner, you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. You don't maintain it one year out of seven. This is the Sabbath of the land. So he gives a Sabbath to the land too. He says, now six days uh, you shall do your work. And on the seventh day you shall rest, and your ox and your donkey may rest. And the sons of the female servants and the strangers may be refreshed. And in all that I have said to you, uh, be circumspect. In other words, stick to it. Be circumspect, he says there. Uh, and make no mention of my name of others, other gods, nor let it be heard from your mouths. So here we see the Sabbath principles. And of course, we've seen that in the Ten Commandments, you know, to uh, keep the Sabbath holy. And he gives us Sabbath principles for the people, obviously, and the land, the Sabbath principles. You know, first, it speaks of the Sabbath for the land. Now, he's already told them in the Ten Commandments about the Sabbath and, and how many days you're to work and you're to take the Sabbath for man. But he starts here, and God lays it out first with the Sabbath for the land. Six years you plant, one year you rest at land. Six years you plant, one year you, you rest. It was unique, guys. It was unique in the world. In that time, there was no other nation, no other, other country, no other people that would be doing this type of thing, you know. Now, there's two reasons he gives there. First, the land, that the land won't be depleted, right? That's one good reason. It's what you call rotating your crops. God created rotating your crops, rotating the land. Many times farmers will let an entire section just sit, right? They won't put anything on it. Well, they were to do it every, make sure every seven years, the seventh year, you let that rest. It was good for the land and it was good for man. And also, the poor would eat off of it. So those who didn't have land would go through the one that you hadn't planted that year, but there's naturally stuff would come up, right? It would be there anyway. There'd be seeds, and so it'd just grow wild, and the poor could go in there, and the animals could eat on it. And so there's a couple different reasons to let this land rest like that. Now, it's interesting because, see, it's not like the entire nation. Many people think, well, they just didn't plant anything that seventh year in the entire nation, you know, and they're just trying to live off what they did uh, in those six years. No, no. They had sections of land. So this land, one time, would rest every seven years. They got crops growing over here to feed them, the people, and then next time this one would rest. So they had these different lands. There's not like they, were, they had to store up for a famine that seventh year. God just said, let it rest. And there's a couple reasons there. 
And like I say, crop rotation. Any good farmer knows you don't want to deplete the soil. But I want to make a note. They failed. They didn't do it. They didn't keep this command from God. They failed in this area, and it determined the years of their captivity in Babylonia. In the Babylonian exile, they paid for this time. Go to 2 Chronicles. If you want to go to 2 Chronicles there, it's after 2 Kings, Old Testament. you got 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, into the Kings, and then into 1 and 2 Chronicles. In 2 Chronicles, in the very end chapter, chapter 36, we read about this and the fact that it cost them because they did not keep the Sabbath on the land. They thought, well, why do that? Why not just plant this land, you know? In six, uh, 2 Corinthians 36, I'm sorry, yeah, chapter 36, verse 15, it says there, and the Lord God of their fathers uh, sent warnings to them by his messengers, by his prophets, right? Rising up early and, and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God. Don't ever mock God. They mocked these messengers of God, these prophets, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against the people till there was no remedy. Basically, he had no other choice. His wrath's going to come now. And therefore, he, uh, he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on the young men or the virgin, on the age or on the weak. He gave them all into his hand and all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house, the Lord, and the treasures of the kings of the leaders and all these he took to Babylon, right? captured this entire nation. And then he burned the houses of God, broke down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all in his palaces with, the, uh, with fire and destroyed all the precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his uh, sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath, you see. As, as long as she lay desolate, this land, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. 70 years, basically, was 490 years. They had not kept the Sabbath on the land, and so they had to pay one year for every year, so 70 years in, in Babylon for that. See, God was not going to be mocked there. God was not going to be mocked. Way back here, 490 years later, they hadn't done it. And so he says, I'm not going to be mocked. You're going you're gonna to sow disobedience to that? You're going to reap punishment. Guys, I use this scripture all the time. And sometimes I bring it right to people's faces. You know? It says in Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Amen? God is not mocked. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. They had mocked God in this Sabbath of the Lamb. And what did it cost him? It cost him years. It cost him years to pay it back in captivity. You know, I got thinking about that. And like I say, so much of the stuff we see here, we see our nation in. I can see our nation in this. The question is, is America reaping what it's sown from mocking God, taking God out, taking God out of our schools, taking God out of our government, taking God out, right? Is America reaping what it's sown? Are the years of payback, right? Are we in the years of payback? I don't know. I believe God wants to do a whole new thing with the church, I can tell you that. But are we there? In verse 12, go back to uh, Exodus it says there uh, in verse 12, yep, 23, on this next page. He says there, uh, Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, and your ox and all this. And obviously we know this, this as the fourth commandment, right? 
the fourth commandment, to keep, uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy and set it apart, right? This Sabbath that many don't do. We as a church have failed greatly in that, in not keeping the Sabbath. God says, honor and obey this commandment. Should we not honor and obey that commandment of the Sabbath? He says, hey, you've got six days, man. I'm giving you six days. Go out there and work those six days. And then take that Sunday. And not just Super Bowl Sunday. You know, how many didn't come to church throughout our country on Super Bowl Sunday because they're, oh, i got to get things ready for my Super Bowl. Got a bunch of buddies coming over. Got to get the beer on the ice and the barbecue going. Hey, go to church first. It didn't start until, I don't know what time in the afternoon anyway, you know. Go to church first and then fill the ice chest full of beer and have your barbecue and stuff. Give God that Sabbath. Amen? Are we paying for that? What does it cost us? What does it cost the church for not honoring that Sabbath? I don't know. In verse 14, continue on. And if man borrows anything from his neighbor, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter there. In verse 14, the... uh, uh, three times you shall keep a feast to me in a year. And so he's going to go on now into these, these sacrifices unto the Lord. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I has commanded you. And at the time appointed in the month of Abib, uh, by the way, this is the time that when they came out of Egypt, remember the Passover lamb and everything, what God had told them to do. They, ate, they had the leavened bread, and then they, they painted the doorpost and the, the header with the uh, blood of the lamb. He says, in the time of, in the month of Abib, which it was then, uh, for in it you came out of Egypt, none shall appear before me empty, he says, in the feast of the harvest and the first fruits of your labor, which you have sown in the field and the feasts of the ingathering. So there's three different feasts here, right? At the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field, three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. So God gives down this command to do these things. God commands three times a year these different feasts. Now, we know the one of unleavened bread that connects with Passover, right? Right? That one with uh, the, 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 the um, sacrifice of that lamb. And it connects right with Passover, this unleavened bread. Now, the first fruit one, the first fruit, it says there, that harvest, uh, that first fruits harvest land, it's actually in the spring. It also is with Passover, by the way. So you have seven days of Passover, or, or I'm sorry, of the unleavened bread, and then the, on the Sabbath, they would sacrifice the lamb and, and make that offering to God in this particular month, just like they did in Egypt. Now, the first fruit was the day after that Sabbath, which was a Sunday. So why is Jesus, as Paul writes Jesus, as our first fruit, right? Because it was on that Sunday that he rose from the tomb after the Sabbath and uh, the unleavened bread. Now, the ingathering, they call really today, they call it the, the Feast of Booths, booths, like little shacks, okay? And they would put together these sticks, and it's in the fall time at the end of the harvest, and they put together these little booths, and they live in those. They get out of their houses, and they go live in these little booths, and it's to remind them of their 40 years that God took care of them out in, uh, in the wilderness. So they got these three different ones. You see a lot of details, guys, if we ever get to the book of Leviticus. We see a lot of details on all these different things here. Go on to verse 18 now. You shall not permit a sorcerer. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter again. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread. Okay, so you're not going to do this lamb. You don't do it with leavened bread. Nor shall the uh, fat of my sacrifice remain until morning. Nothing's to be left of it. The first of uh, the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Okay, 
throws that in there. Don't boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Don't boil that kid in its mother's milk. Amen? Hmm. So in verse 18, it speaks about no blood. Uh, the fact that there is to be, he says there, uh, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread. There's to be no leavened bread. In fact, there's known to be no leaven within the entire house. So why is this? Why no leaven? Because leaven throughout the Bible, and you'll see it, leaven is a symbol for sin. Right? So he says you can't have any of that within your house when you're doing these sacrifices unto the Lord. And you're to take it all out. It's a, the, the blood is a blood atonement. As they sacrifice this lamb, they say, don't leave any fat, basically burn everything up. Whatever they don't eat, whatever they don't burn, there's nothing left in the morning, basically. So there's no leaven there because it's a symbol for sin. We, Paul says a little leaven, leaven to whole lump, right? And he speaks about the church and sin and coming in and adopting sin in a church, a leaven the whole church. So I like to resemble this, guys, to uh, obviously when we, when we take the Lord's Supper, right? When we participate in the Lord's Supper together, and during that time, you want to get the leaven out, right? You want to get rid of your sin. Basically, you confess your sin. During that time of worship, as those guys are bringing that forward, just give it up to the Lord and say, Lord, you know what? Uh, forgive me of this, forgive me of that. Just silently, as we're doing worship. Because, see, the fact of the matter is, the Lord's Supper and that unconfessed sin, that does not mix either. Just like he said here, you don't, you don't mix the blood, the blood of the sacrifice with leaven, and so that for us doesn't mix either. And so just, just turn it over. I mean, that's one of those ways I love the Lord's Supper. You may not know it, but that's exactly what I'm doing. While that music's going, I'm saying, Lord, you know, about yesterday, God. About the day before that, maybe, you know. So anyway, they don't mix together there. That's what he's telling them. Verse 19, he says, The first of the fruits of your, of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. What is this boil a kid in its mother's milk? A young goat, right? Basically, that was a pagan practice, a pagan ritual. And they would do this in those times in these other lands. The pagans would do that. They'd take that goat and they'd boil it in mother's milk, and it was to give them fertility, right? Fertility throughout. And so he just throws that in there. Don't get mixed with any pagan stuff either. Now we're going to see here as God promises, promises him his presence with him and his blessings with him. In verse 20, 20 now, we see there, but if you, but if you in, uh, indeed obey his voice, I'm sorry, in verse 20, behold, I sent an angel before you to keep you in a way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared, he says now. Behold, I'm going to send an angel before you. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions. And then he says, God says, for my name is in him. So this angel, he says, I'm going to send this angel. He promises this presence of one and this blessing of one. This angel, question is, who is this angel, right? You're going to say, well, who's this angel, pastor? Well, we know the name of a couple angels. We know Michael the archangel, and we know Gabriel. Now, both of those names, because he says there, he says, uh, he says my name is in him. My name is in him. Well, in both of those names, God's name's in. El. El Shaddai, right? El. Michael and Gabriel. God's name is in them. Both. El is one of those portions of God's name. But see, we see neither Michael or Gabriel with any type of uh, uh, commandment of Com commanding Israel ever, or anyone for that matter, to this type of obedience, he says right here. He says, you know, he says there, uh, beware of and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will, part he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. We don't see them having that type, that type of ability there in 
either one of those angels, nor to be able to sit in judgment of Israel or sit in judgment of man. So who is this angel? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, is, he says, my name in, is in him. Yahshua. Literally, Jesus' name is Yahshua. Yahweh, right? And so that's who it is, Yahweh. It would be present. This is another one of those pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus Christ. You can call them Christophanies if you like. I've showed you several of those throughout Genesis and Exodus where Jesus is present. And so that's who's there. He says he's going to bring you to a place, right? He says I'm gonna, he's going to bring you to a place that he's prepared. In verse 20, and, and to bring you into a place which I have prepared. Now, obviously, he's taking them into the promised land. Jesus is going to be present with him all this time through what is... He, he describes as this angel. He bring him into a place that they prepared. Well, it's the same for us. Jesus brings us to a place that he's prepared for us. He says, I go away now, but don't worry. I'm going to come back and get you. I go to prepare a place for you. You know, plus Jesus prepares a place for us right here, guys. Do you understand? Jesus has prepared so much for you as you grow in the Lord day to day. Jesus prepares you for the next step. Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which what? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God is preparing you for things. You know, I look back in my life, and, and uh, I see all these areas over years and years and years of preparation. Preparation to eventually God would sell me in a wheel hoy and be a pastor here. But there were many other things I did in the meantime. But preparation. It says there God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. And so it's the same today for us. Jesus is preparing heaven for us, plus he's preparing the here and now. Amen? In verse 22, as we read on. Oh, yeah, we better read on here. He says, but if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the, the Amorites, uh, bring you in to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Pezzarites and the Canaanites and, and the Hivites and the Jebusites, all those ites, and I will cut them off. He says, you shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them nor do according to their works, but you should utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. So you shall serve the Lord your God and he will bless your bread and your water and I will take sickness away, he says, if you'll just do this, do this, do this. I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days, God says there. If you will, I will do this. Now, this is what you call an, a conditional promise of God. There's unconditional promises, unconditional covenants, like he made with Abraham. This is a conditional. What about us? What about us? Are we held to this, guys? Are we held to these kind of things? No. We're saved by the blood of Christ. That's called the new covenant. You know, they needed to be obedient in these things. He says, if you will, I will. We're saved by the blood of Christ. It's different for us. Though there's consequences for our disobedience, as I said, God is not mocked. There's consequences. We are blessed by Jesus, that angel. We'll be taken care of. Uh, and it's not by our obedience. It's not by our work. Uh, you know, or that obedience that we have not had before. It's not by that at all. In Ephesians, I'm going to turn to Ephesians. And if you want to turn there, you can. Move on here. Verse 1. It says there, Blessed be the God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing. See, for Israel, they had to keep these laws and do these things. But for the Christian, we do them willingly. Why? 
Because we have these spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, we should be holy and without blame before him in the love, having predestined us to, to uh, adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory, to his grace, by which he made us accepted by, in his beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in all things Christ, both which is in heaven and which are on earth in him. And in him we also obtained an inheritance, it says. And we've also, if you go down, we've been sealed. It says, according, uh, it says, in him you also trusted after you heard, verse 13, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, of whom you also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So for them, this was very important news, right? He says, if you will, I will. It was a conditional promise. Praise Jesus. You know, why do we obey? Why do I obey the Lord? Why do I obey his commands to me? Because he already paid the price for what he did for me, you see. It's what he did. And now we got to read on here real quick. We'll get through verse 27 through 30, going back to chapter 23. And they're going to take possession of the land. This is how they're going to take possession of their land that God's going to give them here. In verse 27, it says, I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets uh, before you, which shall drive the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, God says, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land, he says. So they're going to inherit the land this way. He says, I will do this. I will do this. I will send fear. I will cause confusion. Guys, we see a lot of fear and a lot of confusion today, right? So he says, I will send these hornets also. I'm not going to try to make anything out of these hornets. The fact of the matter is, God can use natural phenomena, natural things, and God can use supernatural things. God can use them both. He causes this fear. He's going to cause this confusion. You know, in 2 Timothy, it speaks about end times, and it says, in the end times, perilous times will come. That perilous times translates into those times of stress and confusion. It also says in the Bible, it speaks about there be complexing of the nations. They don't know what to do. We see those things taking place. And God can use the supernatural or the natural. In verse 29, as we finish this down through here, he says there, I will drive them out from you, not in one year though. In verse 30, he says, little by little, I'm going to drive them out. Little by little. He says, I'll do this. But it's going to take little by little. It'll take time. It's not going to be in one year. You know, I think about so many things that I believe God wants to do through his church in our land. It's going to take time. It took a lot of time to get here, didn't it? It took a lot of time. I don't know. From the end of World War II is when everything started going boom, 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 boom. God's getting taken out. 1967, I think, God was taken out of the, out of the school, somewhere around there. It took a lot of time to get there. It's going to time to get back also. Also, let's look at it. I got a personal way we can look at what he says here. Little by little, right? Little by little, I will drive them out from you. And little by little, these things will happen. This is how God works. It's as though it sometimes frustrates us. This is often the way God works in our life. He clears things out little by little. I think I spoke this on Sunday one time. He takes a little by little. Though we might prefer it all at once, but God wanted Israel to have increase in the process of taking the promised land. He wanted them to have a part of that, of taking the promised land. He wanted them to grow. God cares that we grow. And so 
he often grows us little by little, right? Now we're gonna, he's going to give them these boundaries that he's going to set. In verse 31, he says, And I will set your boundaries from the Red Sea to the uh, Red Sea to the Philistine and from the desert to the river, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out from before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods, he says. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. God says he's going to drive them out. He's going to drive them out. He's going to drive out that pagan worship. He says, don't you be a part of that either. Why? Well, in verse 33, and we see what has happened to our land. He says, if they dwell in your land, lest you make you, they're going to make you sin. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto you. We have been snared, literally. And many churches have been snared in false doctrine. It's a snare unto us, you see. But I want to make a final note here as we close. God granted Israel this land. I believe that God granted America as a land, as a border, as a nation, through our forefathers. God granted Israel this land. But he also said there, he told them, you're going to have to possess that land. You're going to have to keep that land. You're going to have to protect that land, right? He says, I want you to possess this land. I'm going to get you there. I'm going to grant this land to you. But Israel had to possess it, to keep it, protect it, fight for it, possess it. Amen? To possess it in God. One final thing. There is a spiritual principle here. God may grant but we must possess, you understand? God may grant, but we must possess. He withholds our possessions of many blessings until we will partner with him in bold faith and obedience. We have been granted every spiritual blessing, as it said in Ephesians 1, verse 3, in heavenly places, but will only possess what he, we will partner with him in faith in obedience to receive. We must possess what he's granted. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Whew, that's a lot of verses, God. Lord, I pray that you, uh, God, you just do your work within the body of Christ. Lord, you would revive your children to serve you to serve the one and true and only God. And Lord, what, what time will bring, little by little, we don't know, Lord. We really don't. But God, you do. And so we give you, we give you our lives. And we give you our worship. In Jesus' name.